Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, welcome to the session. Um, every weekend we have this master uh, class being conducted. And as part of the master class, we will be discussing some of the important concepts that you need to upskill yourself into along with the concepts that you are learning as part of your class. Now, today's session, we will be speaking about something very, very important which is called as data ingestion concept. I'm pretty sure uh, most of you people have already completed your project, at least one project, I'm assuming. You have got that exposure on how to deal with the uh, data science projects. But uh, let me let me uh, right, put it in, in a very simple uh, way. Let me ask certain questions. Think, think from this perspective. This is where the industry is moving now. So you'll also have to focus on these aspects. Before I start right, the actual discussion, I want you people to think about these points. So I will talk about data science project. Okay, if, if you have already done these things in, in as part of your project, in your project, then well and good. But if not, think about it. As part of the data science project, of course, we will use CRISP MLQ methodology. Right? Uh, I will be discussing about this uh, a little late. Let me first come up with the main agenda of the uh, class of this particular session. So we will be using CRISP MLQ methodology in order to implement a workflow, right? A project to accomplish a project. We, we basically call it as machine learning workflow. All right. Now, as part of this, we understand the requirements. We gather the requirements. We get the data. We try to understand that. We clean it. We process it. Uh, then we go for data mining project. Uh, I'm sorry, data mining implementation. Post that, we, we tune the algorithm and then we finally evaluate and consider one solution, which is generalizing the entire business problem. The algorithm which is trying to generalize, that is more important. So we try to take that and then we, we probably deploy it or we give to the deployment team, which is integrating the solution into the entire infrastructure so that the end user start using your ML model that is developed. This is the understanding, or you can say this is the um, expectations from a data scientist, right? Now let us think about it. whatever the data set is, right? Now, majority of the cases we'll have to simulate the data. 99.9% .9 of the cases we will simulate the data. So this data that you're going to work on is sample data. It will be a sample data, whatever the data set that you create. Assume that it is 5,000 records, right? Now this is historical data. Now on this data, we do cleaning. If required, we do transformations. We look at scaling issues. We treat the outliers. If there are any outliers, we'll have to treat them. Uh, transformation looks into dummy variables as well as normal distribution. Right? Ultimately, we are trying to organize the data. All this is basically called as data pre-processing. Other steps also are there, part of uh, data pre-processing. We basically do all these uh, various things for cleaning the data, pre-processing the data, and ensuring that data is ready. Ready for what? Ready for ML applications. This is the expectation, right? We, we do this. 
Now, on the historical data, you have 5,000 rows, um, let's say 10 columns or 20 columns, whatever that is, okay? We do all these uh, various things and uh, make it ready, make the data ready. Once this is done, we partition the data, right? And we say train. If I have a lot of data, then I will take validation. And then I will also take test data. So train and validation are basically used to ensure that we get the model trained and also tuned. Using validation data, we tune it. And finally, we have tested data, which will allow, uh, allow us to generalize, right? Evaluate the model for generalization. Once this is done, we get the model and we say, this best model is saved. We, we generally use this in pickle form. And then uh, we either use Flask applications or generally it's Flask application that we, we try to use to deploy this. So using Flask, we develop the HTML UI, and then we try to put this, this ML uh, solution as a standalone solution. If you're using Flask and then creating HTML UI, that means it's a standalone application. We need specialized teams. We call them as ML Ops teams, ML Ops engineers, who productionize this solution. Okay, these are the people who do productionizing. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, probably in a separate uh, session altogether. But ultimately, whatever the solution that you are trying to work on, which is developed on this data set, has to be going into the production environment. Now, this is the uh, expectation. Now, I'll, I'll just erase this and I'll go back a few steps and then ask the questions. I'm just setting the context. Now let me ask the questions. All right. So we did data pre-processing. Now in the 5,000 records and 20 columns that we have right here, let's assume that we had outliers. So we did outlier treatment, assume that we had used Vincerization to deal with that particular outline. Scaling issues were there, so we used normalization to address the scaling issues. Okay, so let's say these are the two things that we had and we managed to solve these problems in the data and then of course normal distribution we did transformations also so these are the three things assume there are three challenges in the data and we address them and then the solution that you have developed the, the data is ready right you, you have addressed the issue you have developed the machine learning model and then you are deploying this Now, when you say deploy, this is in the production environment, assume that ultimately the customers have to start using it. Now, when customers are using it, do you think there will be no new data that is getting generated? Is customer having only 5,000 records and 20 columns? That's it. Think about this question. Do you think business remains constant? Don't you think there will be any changes in the business because of various factors? We generally call it as best. Political, economical, social, and uh, technological changes. Yeah, don't you think 
because of the business change, the fields change. Yeah. So in, in short, we are calling it as data drift. I will ask you another simple question. When we were dealing with this 5,000 records and 20 columns, you people have looked at three challenges, right? So this, this is also highlighted, three challenges you have seen and you implemented those solutions. Now, let's say after another month of, of the business, there was another 5,000 records generated. So first you had 5,000 records. Now in next month, we have another 5,000 records. So total, now you'll have 10,000 records that can be used for training so that your mid model becomes ready for the next month. Let's say this is the first month, this is the second month. So using first month, we built a model which is used for prediction on second month. But after the second month is over, we already know the actual data. So two months together, we have 10,000 records. Now I want to retrain it because there will be some changes, right? This, this, these are the important things that you need to look at. Business drift and data drift. So it makes sense for me to train the model with as much as data possible so that the trained model can be used for predictions here. Isn't it? Now, in the first month data, we saw three challenges. Data was not normal, so you have transformed the data. Scaling issues were there in multiple columns, so you did normalization. There were outliers in certain columns, and you have to handle them using winterization. Right? Now, what if in this next 5,000 records that we are talking about, now the total data is 10,000 records, right? So I already have my model ready prepared for 5,000 records, but do you think the 5,000 records that you have generated, the business has generated the second month, do you think it will have only these three challenges? What if this 5,000 records have missing data? What if? Yeah. What if there are duplicates in the data? What if new fields are added? Isn't it? There are changes coming into the picture. Forget about new features. We'll talk about only 20 features for now. Right? We'll, we'll take one step at a time. Only 20 features are there, but these 20 features have new issues. Missing values is one issue. Now, the code that you have developed, which was run to train on the 5,000 records, can I reuse the same code? Hmm. I cannot. Right? If I have to retrain the model, I cannot use the same code because I did not include missing value check. I did not include a dummy variable check. So I have to rewrite my code, at least with respect to these two things to be included. Next new data comes again, next month, another new data. So the data gets piled up, right? So we will be reusing this entire data set for training purposes. So do you expect a person to keep changing the code every time new data has to be used? Don't you think automation is required here, which can actually verify all these challenges that could be there? 
and automatically handle if those issues are there. Now that will ensure the effort of the data scientist reduced, the effort of all the resources is reduced, right? So this is where the industry is moving now. Because of these practical challenges, the industry is looking at ML ops standards. So whenever an application is developed, we need to ensure that the code that we are writing for developing this application is ready for production environment. Right from the go, word go, you develop the application in such a way that it can be productionized. Olden days, right? Uh, th those days are gone where you stay, say that, okay, we will first develop the model, then we will see if it works or not. Then we will try to apply it on the production environment. Then we will keep monitoring it. We will see whenever it changes, we'll also check it. Those days are gone, right? This implementation, this idea, basically what we're discussing here is nothing but pipelines. automated data pipelines, all right? Now we are not discussing about the entire pipelines. That's not, not what the scope of this particular masterclass is. This particular masterclass, we will be focusing on how we can push the data, how we can get the data, because we're talking about end-to-end -end pipelines, end-to-end -end data pipelines. So I will talk about what is pipeline, how, what are various things that we need to consider in the pipeline, but our focus is in the first step of the pipeline where we will ensure that the continuous data flow is always there for data scientists to ensure that their strategies can be implemented. But remember what I have explain just now. These are some of the questions that you'll always have to think about when you're trying to work on any project. And to solve this, we have uh, of late been uh, seeing a lot of uh, noise around the automated libraries. Now, when I say automated libraries, Python code, which will automatically verify each and every step and highlight these are the issues in your code. So we have uh, right now, right, uh, these libraries being used, th these areas, automated or auto EDA techniques, automated Hyperparameter tuning. In short, we also have automated ML techniques. Auto Keras, Auto Escola, and Auto Teapot. Right? These are all some of the examples. Here we have grid search, random search. Um, here we have Sweetways, Pandas profiling, detail, some of the libraries. Now, people who have already done projects, you might want to relook into these strategies to be included in your projects. You've already done that. You might have code and all that. Try to improve your code. Assuming these are the things that you'll have to now fit into your solution. Okay. This, this gives you that uh, exposure. People who have recently joined on the projects, like projects or who are currently doing the projects, you people might want to also look into these things and implement them in your developments. From the interview perspective, these are very, very important nowadays, right? Uh, interviews are being focused, uh, the, the diversion, right? There is a slight diversion on, on these libraries right now. So focus on these things. 
Now, as I said, we will be talking about data ingestion step as part of this particular program. To highlight, um, a data pipeline uh, is nothing but series of steps which will allow the data to be moved from point A to point B. But when you say point A, you don't have a single point, but you might have multiple sources. Point B also might have multiple destinations. So we need to integrate all these solutions that we have in the data set. Right, so that's the data pipeline logic. End to end, when I say end to end, we talk about the source and destination. Okay, source and destination. Point A to point B. I'll show you some of the images which are readily available. You can also look into those images on Google as well. Some of interesting uh, images that I, I like. The pipelines that we are talking about here, right? They could be of different types, three different types, broadly, you can say. One is called as batch data pipeline. In this, we move the data at one interval. The entire data that we have, we are going to push it into the next level. Okay. Uh, this is called as bulk ingestion, or we can also call it as ETL processing. The entire data set, okay? whatever the data we have, everything will be moved into next point. Streaming data pipeline, we can also call it as live data streaming pipelines. This means as the data is generated, it is moved into the next level of destination. This is called as continuous flow. It's like we have a pipeline established, uh, open pipeline established as water falls in it goes. Right? So that's about your streaming data pipelines. Then we also have something called as CDC pipelines, which are used only to refresh the data. So you'll have two systems. Right? Whenever this transactional data is getting updated, whatever the fields that are getting updated, only that will reflect it. Only that will be changing the uh, effect. Only that point will be moved. This is called as CDC. Ultimately, both should be in sync. Say for example, I have five, here also it will be five. Now, because of some transaction, this five is changed to 10. Rest of the data will remain same, right? So CDC says this five, it has updated to 10. So you need to update that to 10. Okay, that's your CDC pipeline. Now, when we talk about pipelines, there are uh, certain points that you need to look into. Sorry. Um, the softwares that we are using should be easy to configure and to maintain. And uh, they should be um, allowing the real time data uh, ingestion. And data could be in different sources. So that the software should have the um, right capability to connect with the different um, sources that, that we have. Because in different source, the data could be in different format. So the software should be scalable to understand those variations. And majority of the open sources are used here. And Python is one of those sources that we use for um, doing the data pre-processing in that entire pipeline. So ultimately, the idea is to develop this pipeline. You can see the data pipeline says, here you are doing all the data related transactions. Once this is done, we go for model transactions, model related transactions. And this will ensure that we get a solution. And when new data comes in, this arrow is basically means it passes through all this and then gets the results. 
Okay, live data, when new data comes in, it, it actually goes through all this process, which is shown like this. So irrespective of what data, what challenges or what form of data we are having, it has to pass through the series of steps in order to give us the results. Okay, that is the logic of your data pipeline. Now, whenever we talk about data pipelines, we need to try and understand how you design, how you plan your pipelines. And standard ways, there are eight phases for your data to flow from source to destination. I'm specifically talking about data, uh, uh, sorry, machine learning related pipelines. So it all starts with data ingestion layer, and this is where we are focusing. Then we have data collector or data collection layer, then data pre-processing, then storage, then analytical layer or query layer, and then finally we'll have visualization. These six stages are basically flowing from one to the other next stage. Along with these six, we have two additional layers which fit in everywhere in all the six stages. Those are security layer and monitoring layer. Security ensures that right, uh, we, we external sources cannot, uh, uh, hackers cannot get into this particular flow to get the data. Monitoring is ensuring that whatever the data that is flowing is, is consistently flowing without any leaks. So these two layers are, are fitting into all the layers. Now let us uh, try and uh, define the steps here. The ingestion layer will be the first step, right? As the name, you can see the names, you, you understand, right? So data ingestion layer is the first step that comes into the picture, which allows us to connect to various sources, right? So we will, we will try and understand where the data is coming from, what is the source, right? And we should be able to integrate with those sources. Then we have data collection layer, Data ingestion layer and data collection layer are always tightly coupled together. The data collection layer is, is basically getting the data from the ingestion layer. This will ensure that the collection layer is ensuring that the data that is being ingested is made available for the rest of the pipeline. Okay, so collection. It's like you're starting to gather all the data. And to do that, we need ingestion layer, which, which establishes the connections. Now, once we have collected the data, then comes the pre-processing layer. Right, and this is very important layer and time-consuming layer. Right, uh, whatever the data that we have, right, is being processed here for, for the analytical results or for cleaning purposes, okay? Then comes the tricky part, which is data storage layer, right? So we have collected the data, fine, but where do you store it? Yeah? And these two can also be interchanged. These positions, right? These two layers can change the positions. You can first store and then do the pre-processing or you pre-process and then store, All right? And when you talk about storage, this is where you need to uh, devise the strategy for, um, you can say, Scalability, you can, you can talk about scalability. You need to plan up ahead on how much data you might gather, 
right? How much data you might have to store, right? Because we keep getting the data and we keep storing it. So what should be the size of the storage device? How should the data be stored? What format? So this way, a lot of questions come into picture in the data storage layer. And finding the right storage solution is important because that is going to define the entire solution development's efficiency. All right? And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we can interchange these positions also. Then comes the query layer. We, we pre-process the data, clean the data, then we put that into the uh, storage layer. After the data is stored into a specific location, we start oh yeah, asking questions of query. Okay, this is where your analytical steps come into the picture. And once we have the query layer bringing up the answers for the questions, then we try to give value to that particular information, the results that they're getting from the query layer, right? We are trying to give value to that particular information. This is where we, we basically talk about value of the data that is created. Right? Visualization layer, because the end users can understand the information when it is presented in, in something which is easily consumable. So graphs, visualizations, right? We, we, we plots uh, are, are created, summaries are uh, uh, right identified so that the end users can easily understand this particular data. Now, then comes the security layer. Security layer talks about restricting the access to the data for unauthorized purposes or unauthorized users. Right? Data is very, very powerful. It has a lot of information and we cannot give access to any data, every data to anyone. It has to be restricted. Right? So this is uh, basically where we try to ensure that the access controls are set. We, we generally call uh, ACLs, yeah, access controls. So for example, you are not authorized to access an employee's salary. You are another employee and you, you cannot access the salary. So only HR team will have the access and that too within the HR team, only certain designated people can, can have the access. So we need to put those restrictions, right? That's one example of security. Then we also have monitoring layer because we, we keep looking at the model that is being implemented, whether it is giving the appropriate results or not, right? Whatever the data that we are getting, is it reliable? Is it in the right format, right? The accuracies that we are getting from the model, are, are we expecting those accuracies or do we need more accuracies? So these kind of things are done in the data monitoring layer. Okay, there's a question. What does data leak means? Data leak means, I mean, it's a simple English. Data leak is data leak. So for example, you have laptop, right? You are connecting with laptop. There's a lot of personal information. Let's say you have taken images, videos, and all that. You're your friends and family members. There's a folder. When you're trying to, let's say, build face recognition model. Right? You're giving access to that particular folder to the algorithm. So there is a pipeline created. You're, you're importing the images from that particular folder. What if the folder has 100 images? What if only 90 images are considered or 90 images are taken? 
Yeah. So there are 10 images which are not considered. This could be because of various reasons. Format might not be there or copying might not have happened properly. Network issues could be there or somebody would have uh, right connected and deleted those folders. So we don't know. Right. So there, there's some kind of leakage happening, which is impacting the overall data. That's called as data leakage. What is the difference between query layer and visualization? Um, okay, let's say query layer is basically asking a question on, let's say I would, I would, I would say, um, sales. A very, very simple example. Sales of, let's say, five products. Right? What are the sales of five products? You're writing a query here. So what do you'll get? Product one, sales. Product two, sales. Product three, sales. Product four, sales. Product five, sales. You get numbers. Right? You, you get the results printed here like this. But don't you think it makes sense for you to visually represent that? Point one, oh, sorry, product one, product two, product three, product four and product five. So this is a query layer. We're trying to ask certain questions. We will get the answers at this layer, but those answers are better interpreted when you are visually representing them. Right? So data visualization, or you can also call it a serving layer. I hope that clarifies. Now, when we talk about data pipelines, especially in the production environment, we'll always call it as big data pipeline. As I said, the first stage is data ingestion. Then it is getting stored and then pre-processed. Analytical uh, solutions. This is like, you, you, can, you can imagine this, right, uh, friends. Uh, from an ML workflow perspective, okay? You can say data pre-processing is like your um, data cleaning and all those steps. Analysis is like your data mining steps. Okay, so this is EDA, this is cleaning. That, that could be uh, one of the differences that you can imagine. And then finally, after you get the results, you visually represent the data. Now, that is what you are seeing with it. After data ingestion, we have data storage. Data ingestion is basically a process of connecting to different sources and then taking the data, getting the data, right? So that is the data ingestion, which is basically subdivided into data integrate, I mean, the integration part and then collection part. After collecting, you store it. All right, next. This is offline pipeline and this is streaming pipeline. If you see the same boxes are there. The big squares that you are looking at, data ingestion, data storage, data pre-processing, data analysis, and data visualization or data serving. These five steps are common, but in order to implement them, we will have different tools considered. Remember, we, we just discussed a, a slide where we were talking about how do you choose the pipeline softwares? So the, the software should be simple, easily configurable, easily troubleshootable, right? And then it, it should um, connect to various sources um, and then live, live data can also be, right? Uh, has to be uh, streamed using that. So these are some of the questions that, that we need to look at. And you can see those examples like Flume, Kafka, um, then NiFi, uh, then Spark Streaming comes into the picture, then right? Hive, Impala here. 
Whereas in the batch uh, mode, you can see Scoop, HDFS, Spark. These are very basic vanilla model kind of things. Okay, and the another point with respect to this is one another uh, right layer. You can see data integration and data ingestion. Both you can uh, combine them together. And then we have data processing, data storage, and then data analysis too. So as I said, these two are interchanged. Data pre-processing comes first and then the data storage. All right, so this is the difference between ETL and ELT. You might have heard about this ETL uh, terminology. Now we're talking about ETL and ELT. Right? So extract, transform, load. Extract, load, and then transform. Right? So this is extract, transform, and then store it, then load. Whereas the previous slide you have seen is, you can observe here, we are extracting, then we are storing and then processing, ELT. So this is extract. This is extract. This is load. This is transform. Right, and the uh, next slide if we talk about the other way around. Whereas here we are talking about extract, transform, and then. Next, this is data pipelines. This is what is expected in real world case. I, I really love this animation. Uh, this is done by Semantics Data Platform. That's an organization. They've, they've um, right, visually represented the entire pipelines in a very, very beautiful way. We have various data sources where the data might get generated. And this data is getting loaded, right? Where we are accumulating all the data. Then we are transforming the data. Raw data is getting right, transformed. And then we are passing the data to the destination. Destination could be ML models or data visualization dashboards. Or you might also just store the data in, in a right, repository where it can be used further by different other things as well. data sharing. You can, you can also give the data to other people. Right, so this is the um, data pipeline visual representation. Now, when we talk about the pipelines, we are speaking about the pipelines with respect to point A to point B, where point A is where the sources of data lie. And you can see data has different sources. It could come from databases, legacy systems, um, your cloud uh, applications, services, um, on-premise or right, your end user applications, web services could be there, or flat files could be there, operational flat files could be there. Different sources are there, right? And uh, you need to study about these sources. And here you can talk about RDBMS. RDBMS, even today, is the best or is the go to software for archiving the data. Relational database management systems are the softwares where the data is getting stored in a proper table format. We, we call it as HRIS, CRM, right? CRM is probably some of the terminologies which, which is very, very popular. So it is nothing but a relational database management system where, where you'll have data in a table form. That means, Predominantly, your data that you want to process is lying in these systems, RDBMS softwares. 
there are many different types of softwares i mean commercial products or open source products which provide rdbms services but as as we have seen in the previous slide there are other data sources also that we might have databases flat files cloud platforms web services rss feeds right cloud based platforms the services right saas products so on so forth right and these databases can broadly be classified into sql based softwares and no sql based softwares See, sql based softwares will always store the data in table format this is nothing but rows and columns predominantly in other words this is organized data how is it organized it can be in different forms uh, the most ideal form is the table representation then we also have no sql based uh, solution Th this could be in column oriented table key or value pair orientation right this this could be the way graph representation could be there document type is there right column oriented table key and value pair graph based document oriented software so on so forth these are organized in different okay these are you can say something which is not in table form now the first pipeline that we create data ingestion that we need to do is to get the data from these sources right sql based software or no sql software uh, based software and data uh, pre processing tool or data processing tool which is python is so popular that it has readily available database apis that we can use in short python libraries are there which can allow us to directly connect to these sources and then get the data required data and uh, for the demonstration you can see we have four examples shown mysql db is an open source rdbms software which is kind of popular which is now managed by oracle database or oracle as an organization sorry then we have postgres uh, sql postgres sql which is also uh, very popular nowadays it is said to be very much faster than mysql or your table oriented databases then we have microsoft sql server and then the no sql software you can see mongodb right yeah, so these are uh, four example libraries which basically used or uh, are used to get the data okay so we will we will see this demonstration now on how the tables how the content can be extracted into the processing tool called python and all these libraries that we are talking about are python libraries right yeah uh, if you have a question you can please type in the question and um, let's go to the hands on thing okay um we'll take a short break and then uh, connect back okay so it's uh, 255 in the meantime you might want to uh, bring on your questions let's assume that it's 255 right and uh, we'll take 10 minutes break and then we'll connect in 3 or 5 yeah see you the other side please we'll do the hands on okay i see uh, there are certain questions in the chat window one question in fact um, postgres is it a no sql or a sql what it is actually okay 
So let us uh, first discuss about a quick comparison between the databases. And when I talk about database differences, let's start with understanding the difference between SQL and NoSQL to begin with, right? SQL versus NoSQL. In SQL, the data will always be in structured nature. In NoSQL, as the name says, it's not only SQL. So it can have unstructured data as well. That means structured as well as unstructured. The SQL databases, uh, which, which only have structured data, the data is organized always in the table format. Right? That means you will have rows and columns. Whereas when we talk about unstructured data, no SQL databases, the databases can be arranged, the data can be arranged in different ways. Right? As I said, key and value DB, key and value pair kind of a DB. Then we can all column oriented. We can have graph based. We can have document based, event based. Right? So like this, we can have different ways the data can be organized. So here, schema is mandatory. Okay, and it has to be predefined. First, you have the data structure, the, the design of the table, the, the values or the properties of the table predefined. That's nothing but schema. Whereas in NoSQL, it is flexible. Schema is optional. All right? Then another important thing. In order to handle data coming from different sources uh, or different, um, I should say, um, tables, SQL will allow us to work with joins, different kind of joins in there, table joins. Here we don't have joins logic. Joint concept is, is not that right uh, common in NoSQL. All right. So these are uh, some of the comparisons with respect to your uh, databases. And then if I talk about the Postgres, right? If I have to compare the Postgres database, it is also a uh, we can say RDBMS. This is RDBMS database. That means it's a SQL based database. Relational database management system. Okay, MySQL is that. Whereas Postgres is also SQL based databases, though in, in some books they say it is like our RDBMS only, but it also has object relational database. Object is nothing but your data. Right? So that is uh, Another comparison that we can see with respect to your Postgres. We can also have a SQL Server, which is again RDBMS, whereas MongoDB here is no SQL. And MongoDB deals with the data in document forms. The data is arranged as a document form. Document means if you were familiar with JSON format, then you, you'll understand. Okay, so document um, format is used to store the data in MongoDB. We'll also have something called as Red IS, we have HBase and all that. Uh, another very, very popular, nowadays popular is Redis. It is in open source, and this is. Um, you can say key and value pair kind of data, right? It, it holds key and value pair data. HBase is another example. This is column oriented data, right? So on and so forth, different examples will come into the picture. 
right? So that is uh, the comparison. All right. Now let us try and access the data from all these different sources that we are having. Ultimately, the processing that we are doing, right, is going to be in Python only because that is the most flexible data processing tool, which basically means that we need to bring the data into your Python programming language, right? Now we know that Python has a lot of libraries which can be used for directly connecting to these databases. You can see the examples here, wherein for MySQL, we had a MySQL connector. For Postgres, we have a Psycop. Uh, then we for uh, SQL Server, we can have uh, PyODBC, Mongo, PyMongo. Similarly, for Red Eyes, we have Red, uh, Red, uh, Red is Py. And th these are some of the names uh, that, that we, we use. And these are libraries, or you can say Python packages. Okay. All right. So let us try and access these things uh, with respect to. Python. The first one is MySQL database. Let me show that. This is the script. This is the command. We need to install MySQL connector. pip install mysql connector hyphen python once you do that you get mysql dot connector functionality now using this we will be able to connect to the database server and always remember when we are trying to connect to a database it needs to have connect string Okay, so connect string holds these features, the host name, the server name where the software is installed, then the default port numbers, and then the username and password which are used to connect to those databases. Right, so these are uh, the mandatory things that you need to have. This is called as connect string. And here you can see, I'm trying to establish a connection to the database, MySQL database, which is installed in my local computer. If the MySQL database is installed in a different server and if, if it is given as a service, then you are going to put that service name here in place of local host or, or the server name, server address in the host. This is going to allow us to connect to the databases. So the package is already installed in my computer. Right, so I'll just import and then I will say connect to the database. So this is a database connection established. You can see the value here, my DB is a connector. You can also say print my DB. It basically tells that it is a MySQL connector. Now we are going to create a cursor object. Okay, MySQL cursor object. This cursor object is basically responsible for doing all the communication with respect to Python and uh, MySQL. Right? You can you can say that whatever we are trying to execute on MySQL via Python is handled by cursor. Okay, imagine that. Uh, 
I'm going to execute a command called show databases. This is a simple SQL query. This is going to list down all the databases that are available in the MySQL software that you have installed. I'm giving this as a string and defining this as a string, a script. Now I'm going to execute this script here using the my cursor object, execute show databases command. When I do that, the results that, that we are going to get are actually stored in the my cursor and I'm going to say fetch all. This is giving us the result into DB list underscore results. In our software, in my local system, the software has 10 databases installed or created, you can see. Access test DB, DB1, employee, employee one, information schema, MyDB, MySQL, performance schema, sys and test. So these are all different databases that we have created. It's a list. So you can either print it or just double click it and uh, see the list. If you want to create a database, then you can execute this script, which says create database employee one. It is already there, so I'm not executing it. But this is going to create the database employee one. Once the database is created, you might want to connect to that particular database. So in the same script, I'm going to say employee one. And you can see this is the connection DB that, that is installed. So that means you're not generally, uh, it's not just logging in at a higher level, but it is also going into the database. Okay, so that's the logic. Next. I will be able to deal with the databases here. Whatever the SQL queries that, that we can run on the SQL platform, can be done directly using Python console, Python codes. All you have to remember is execute command and then you remember execute many. These are to execute a single command or multiple commands, multiple values. And then to re retrieve, we say fetch and fetch all. Fetch and fetch all. Okay, these are two important, very, very important uh, commands that you need to remember. Okay, and uh, we also have join functions in SQL. Uh, these are SQL qu uh, queries. We, we, we will uh, not, not uh, detail these things here. Our main objective is to how do we connect to that particular database from Python. That is we have something that we have done. And all the queries that we can do on SQL can be done here as well. All right, so this is about your MySQL code. Important thing is these libraries, MySQL connector. Next. Let us look into Postgres. This is also something that I have in my local system installed, so I'll be able to demonstrate this. So we are trying to connect to Postgres DB, which is also something you can say RDBMS only, uh, SQL based databases. To get to uh, Postgres, or it is generally pronounced as Postgres, Postgres, but actually it is Post GRE SQL. Okay. Next. Once you install this library, Cycop 2, second version of the library, it's by previously it's probably was known as uh, Cycop. I, um, I, I never worked on the previous version. I always work with this version only. So install this library and then import. So I'm going to say import. Uh, let me erase all this. Okay. 
I'll close. Okay, it's not there already. My connection is also um, closed when I clean the memory. Now let us connect to Postgres. Import the library, Psychop, and then say connect. The logic remains the same. We need to have connect string. Irrespective of what database you speak about, we need to be able to get the access to the server, that specific port number which was used for communicating things, default port numbers will be there. Then the username and password which have the permissions that right? access controls are given. So you have host username and password and then you will establish the connection. Here. It's a connection string uh, again. And then we say, whenever you are doing any transaction, we want to auto commit the transaction. So I'll, I'll say true. Do you want to auto commit it? Yes, we want it. And I'm creating the cursor object here. I'm calling us CUR. Then just like what we have done in the previous case, we will have to create a database. So I'll say MySQL. This is my string, create database, my DB file. And I'm saying execute this command. Okay, this database is already existing. So it is, it is going to say that database already exists. All right, so you can connect to that particular database, whatever the database that you have created using the same command. It's just that now you are mentioning the DB name, just like the previous thing. And then define the new cursor, which is going to now work on that particular database. So once the connection is established, again, you will be able to execute the SQL queries, just like what we have done in the MySQL databases. The queries are also very similar to what we have done. There. Not, much, not many differences between MySQL and Postgres. Next. There we had fetch all. Here we have fetch one or fetch all. Execute, execute many, right? Same thing here also we have execute and execute many. All right. Once we have established the connection, we will be able to do these queries. Cursor uses. Cursor is an object which is running these queries on your database. You establish the connection, but who's going to ensure that the queries are executed on your database? So we call that as cursor object. That's that's the use of cursor. Now we cannot be able to do the uh, explanation of database, Raghav. That is not the objective of this master class. Yes, commit every time. That's that's what we are talking about, right? We are predefining it. Uh, database driver. Yeah, you can say, right? Cursor is like um, an object which is ensuring that the database drivers work as expected, right? Of database driver itself, you can say that. So this is with respect to. Postgres SQL. The most two popular softwares that are used in today's world because of their open source nature. And they are also being your RDBMS kind of software, SQL based softwares. Okay, next. We look at another example here. This is the MongoDB. This example is talking about NoSQL database. Right? This is a document-based, uh, sorry, document-oriented database. And here we have PyMongo. So we will have to install PyMongo, that's the, the, the software or the library. And then from PyMongo, we are importing PyMongo client. Again, this is also something that is installed in my computer, localhost. So I'm able to demonstrate it. 
So I'm, I'm creating the client. Um, that means I'm, I'm trying to connect. All you have to say is local host and the port number. It has default username password that, that we have. So it's directly connecting. But otherwise, if you have a specific username password, you also have to pass those things. Then to list the database names, you can simply say this database is, these are your database names. One very important difference in MongoDB compared to MySQL or Postgres or any of the RWS uh, systems is that we don't have a specific command for creating a database. MongoDB do not have a separate create DB command. You simply say use database or here we are saying test DB. Or let's say I'll say test DB. I don't have a test DB database, right? So I'll say DB client test DB. And if I'm trying to connect to the database and try to create an object in MongoDB, we call the data being stored as collection. Collection is like your databases, I mean, tables. And within the tables, you have documents, that is rows. Collection is like table within the document, within the collection, we will have documents, which is like record. So I'm connecting to a database called TestDB, which is not there. In that, I'm creating a collection. Once I create the collection, the database will be created. Now you can say, list. data. okay, I've not saved it, One, uh, my mistake. Let me save it also. Okay, now let me see. Yeah, test DB is available. Because the collection is also an empty collection here, right? When I created, it is an empty collection. When I added one document, at least one document, right? The object is created. Then only your database gets created. Okay, so this is um, how your MongoDB works. It's like a Key, uh, I mean, you can see document base, right? So this is one document. It's like dictionary in Python. Within the document, you'll have key and value pair. And uh, here we have insert one or insert many. Similarly, you have find, find command, right? And then, uh, you'll get the results. These are some of the comparative operators that we use in MongoDB. This is uh, something a little different here. So it's less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal, right? So those kind of uh, simple queries that we have. All right, so this is with respect to MongoDB. Of course, you need to understand the various properties of MongoDB to um, run more queries like this. So these three databases I already have installed in my computer. I've been using them for some other purposes. So I'm, I'm showing you the demonstration. But as I said, the process to connect to databases via Python is by using these Python libraries only. Right? Very simple uh, solution. For every database, we have a connector or library. And using them, you will be able to connect. Um, the questions. This code to connect single source of data. How can, what do you mean by single source of data, Ravindra? I did not understand that question. You might want to rephrase that question. Um, Ravindra, multi source host. Uh, what do you mean by multi source host? Is there no cursor for MongoDB? No, the, the cursor terminology is not used here. We use Mongo client, we, we call it as client. Okay, we are using client. It's like cursor only, I think. But we don't use the terminology. All right, so this is with respect to data ingestion, friends, and uh, this one section of today's masterclass. The other concept that we, we, we needed to discuss is with respect to the GitHub concept. 
Now, how many of you have Git accounts? Yeah. How many of you have Git accounts? Very good, very good. Very good, very good. Now, Git is very important. This is used for version controlling. It can be used for CDCI pipeline generation, right? And uh, the beauty is the Git accounts or, or, or Git platform is uh, developed in such a way that, I mean, we have features in which we will be able to directly connect to our Google Colab repositories. Okay, so your Git repositories can directly uh, work with, or your Google Colab can directly work with the Git um, right solutions that we have. So Git versus GitHub, that is the first thing probably you need to understand. But before that, yeah, this is the GitHub uh, repository that I have. And then this is the GitHub with respect to Yeah, 360 digit MG. But yeah, this is GitHub. Then what is Git? Okay, so important question. People who are not familiar, there's something I'll ask Git and GitHub. What you're seeing is GitHub. Right? So GitHub is like your Google Drive. You can just imagine that this is like a Google Drive cloud-based platform, which is specifically designed to manage your Git repositories, right? That means your artifacts, especially designed to have a control over your code while, while you are trying to develop various things, right? In short, GitHub is a cloud-based service which allows us to store and manage the repositories the folders or you can say projects okay and these projects are called as git now using git we will be able to control the development especially with respect to different versions that we right come up with so it's like a version control system you can say this is a version automatic version control system. Because see what happens is if you are working on developing an application, there might be multiple people who are working on the same code or maybe you are working on the code while right, everyday development is happening. So you, you need to track the development, right? So that can be done using your Git and uh, the tracking can be better done using this GitHub. Whereas, right, this is like a, um, cloud based cloud based uh, service for storing it's like a location where you dump your git repositories okay that's a high level difference um, we do have uh, git commands and all that but yeah let's let's not um, heavily focus on that we will try and look at how Google Collab can be used to handle the Git repositories and all that. All right. So let us open the Git repository. Okay, this is our Git repository. Uh, I'm going into databases where I have uh, a folder called data. I will show you how we can access this particular data directly from Git repositories. Okay, first we will we'll look into this and then we'll also discuss about uh, some of the capabilities of your Google Colab, which can directly work with this uh, right platform. All right. Uh, question, GitLab. GitLab is also similar to Git, GitHub only. You can say it's, it's very similar to what we're talking about in GitHub. Yeah. 
It's also public based repositories. All right, so let us uh, yeah, try and look at these things now. I have a very simple demonstration of how we can access data from directly uh, from GitHub. Okay. So here we know Pandas library, right? We, we use Pandas library for inputting the data. I am using the same library, import pandas as pd. And then I will have to point to the GitHub repository, right? This GitHub repository. So I can I can go to the GitHub repository where my data set is stored. This is my data, data set, right? So I'll click on that. And you see, this is the data set. We, we already know this data set, right? Uh, we have used in our classes we will click on the raw. You see the raw option, you click on the raw option and you get the URL here. Access this URL, copy and paste it here as URL. I'm defining it as a string. So let me remove everything here. I'll say import pandas as PD and then I'll say URL. I'm defining this as a string and just your pd command pd and uh, read underscore csv or whatever the file version is right uh, the format is here i'm using a csv file so i'm, I'm using the same command and then say read underscore csv that's all you have done so the difference is rather than having the file in your local folder local system folder you're putting that in the git repository right that's that's the difference that's all so the process of accessing the file is same, but remember it has to be in its raw format. Okay, and then we have uh, pd dot read underscore csv, and this is your data set. All right, so this is about your Git repository data access. Okay, um, how Google Collab is used. Google Collab is used just like your Jupyter Notebooks. What is it used for? As I understand it, simple. Google Collab is just nothing but Jupyter Notebooks, which is a little com uh, right, um, customized by Google itself. So it's a service which is provided by Google to write your Python codes using Jupyter Notebook interface. Can you explain how to upload? Upload, okay. Upload is just like what we do. I mean, if you're talking about Git commands, then yeah, probably we need to discuss that in a different session altogether. But in order to upload the data, you can just say add file, create new file or upload files. And you just drag and drop your files. That's all. But you need to choose the right repository. Um, yeah, if you have to have private access, then yeah, you need to also look at the authorizations and all that. Previous. It's not that easy to have access to the private content. Can private, yes, private data can be stored in GitHub, but accessing that needs permissions. Okay. Yeah, Git repository, from Git repository only, I'm saying. You need to have access, it's just like a database. You need to have access controls to these uh, Git repositories which are in private mode. Only then you'll be able to access. Like username, password, kind of authorization should be there. Guys, please hold on to your questions. We have two hours window. I'll not be able to complete or show everything that is there under the sky. Right? So let me cover some aspects. And too many questions, I'll not be able to address all of them. 
Please hold on. Please hold on. We'll probably have another session for all these queries. All right. So this is Google Colab. All you have to do is search for Google Colab, and you'll get this URL: colab.research.com. I'll, I'll show certain sort of shortcuts that will help you to um, right uh, deal with uh, certain things, especially when you are dealing with uh, libraries that are there in the various GitHub repositories. So this is my um, you know, frequently accessed notebooks. So this is how your Google Colab looks like to start with. So Google Colab is nothing but an interface that is provided specifically for people who are trying to learn um, right, these uh, certain things like data science, machine learning kind of things. It gives you a Python kernel without having any server. The beauty is it also helps you to get GPUs access, limited access, of course, for free, especially if you have a lot of data that needs to be processed using GPU capabilities, then you can for a trial basis, you can try and do that. All right. And uh, yeah, you can, these are some of the examples. You can scroll down and see all these examples. Okay. All you have to do is say code, uh, plus code is going to add code here. But yeah, let me open repository here. Okay, let me open this. I'll see what, what code we have there. Okay. So this is uh, uh, another very um, simple code. Um, as you see, this nothing but Python commands. But when you open your Google Colab page, you will see you get a notebook. This is like Jupyter notebook interface, right? And all you need to have is a Gmail account. Okay. Now you see the connect here. Once you open your Google Colab, it is not giving you access to the kernel, which is used for your uh, right execution. You can say, right, uh, different options are there. You might want to um, use your custom uh, Google Cloud environment as well. If you have a GCP account and if you have a virtual machine created there, then you can connect to that virtual machine directly from Google Colab here. Right? You can also use a hosted runtime, local runtime, and all that. I'll, I'll simply say hosted runtime, or you can click on connect button. Once you click on connect, it is connecting to a free server, Python 3 environment, Google Compute Engine. Right? And it is connected now. So it has given me a memory of 12.6 GB overall and 100 GB storage, out of which 38.39 GB is already occupied. It's, it's proportion to your Google Drive access. If your Google Drive has that kind of storage capacity, then it will show that storage capacity. And uh, this is just like your Python code. Um, I'll just write import pandas as PD, click on that. Now, if I want to access a file directly from Google Colab, then what should I do? Your local installations, right? Local implementations, we have the uh, details passed directly here with respect to the static file, the complete location of that particular file, right? In, in local installation. But in Google Colab, it's a remote server where I mean, your kernel is running on a remote server. It needs to have access to your folders in your local computers. That is directly not possible. So what you do is you, you try to upload the file from your local machine to a temporary storage space that is given here. 
if you click on the folder symbol, it, it opens like this. This is where you can store your files for temporary purpose. The symbol that you are seeing here, this is to upload the files, import the files from your local machine to this particular platform. It's only for temporary purpose. I'm going to access the same file that you see here, university data set. It's a CS, uh, Excel file, not a CSV file. Reminder, uploaded files will get deleted when this runtime is recycled. So that whatever the instance that is assigned to you, if it is decommissioned, if you're closing that, then the data will also be deleted. Okay, you see that? okay. But you can see the file is now loaded on your Google Colab platform. If you want to know the path, the location of this file, when you hover your mouse on that file, you see the three dots. If you click on that, it will say copy path. You can just copy path and paste it here. This is an Excel file. So I'll say read underscore Excel from Pandas and I'll be able to read the data. And you can see data types, I'm, I'm printing the data types. It, it gives us the information about the table content, the data field content. This is on a temporary occasion. Now, what if you want to directly access the data from your Google Drive, because it's a Google product, right? So you'll be able to directly access the data which is stored on Google Drive. And to do that, you need to establish, again, the connection from the Google Collab to your Google Drive. To do that, it will ask you to punch in your username password of Google account where the Google Drive is, is given. Now to get the Google Drive access, again, here you see the folders, you see this symbol, the triangle symbol on the folder, you click on that. This is allowing us to drive, uh, mount the Google Drive or establish a connection between Google Collab and then Google Drive. Permit this notebook that you are creating to access Google Drive files. Right? You can say no thanks or you can say yes. Okay? So I'll say connect to Google Drive. When I say that, it actually needs to give me a code. Oh, it's directly connected uh, because previously I might have done this. So it is directly giving me the access, but otherwise it should actually allow you to run some code here. And when you click on the code, it redirects you to a different page where it will ask you to log in the username password, right? Using your username password, log in to your Gmail so that it can access your Google. And once the establishment is done, you can see here. So I'll, I'll try to revoke. Okay, I'll just remove the access. Let me see if I can redo that by getting the username password thing. No, I'm not getting the username password. I think it's, it's already stored in my. Location. Yeah, it's already there. So it's, it's directly asking me to connect. Now, if I want to access, let's say some data here, I will try and look at some data. I'm not sure where I put the data here. Okay, too many things, too many things. Okay, let me search. Um, okay.
Ah, okay, I got data. So I've come to the location where I have the data. So I'll just copy this part. And I will create new line here. I'll say edu is equals to pd dot read underscore csv because it's a csv file. And then I'll mention this part. So look at that, the entire path is given. Okay. So this is the um, folder. I mean, this is the command, this is the location. And I'll say PD. PD is not defined. Okay, my bad. I need to execute this. This, this command is executed. Now, if I execute this again, it should be able to access the data. Done. I'll say edu dot head. It gives us the first five records. So this is how you can access the data directly from your Google Drive. Now, what if I have a folder, a file in my, let's say, let me cancel this. What if I have a file, which is a, kind of a code in my location? So let's say, create new file. I'll say, Python codes slash, um, okay, example. This is one of the drawback with respect to, oops, your Git. To create some folders, you need uh, this kind of uh, access. Then I'll say upload files. And let me drag and drop some files, uh, which are IPython notebooks, so that I can show you how it is accessing the IPython notebooks. So I'll, I'll probably use the same thing here. I'll drag and drop here. Then I'm from a change. So under Python codes, I have the file. Let me delete this. Yeah. Okay, this is the Python code. What is it? It's nothing. Is it an empty file? Oh, great. Okay. I need to show something. Yeah, okay. Let me try and upload some other file, which actually has some content. Let me see if I can store some file, which is simple. Okay, let me try and load this hierarchical clustering code. Okay, done. This is my code. Yeah, you can see the code is right here given. A very simple uh, right example. I'll click on draw. If I say raw, this is what you get, right? Now, how do I edit this IPython notebook directly from here, okay? The edit file can be used here. This is how we can edit in the uh, IPython notebook uh, scenario. Or I can simply say, I mean, once I'm here, I would say uh, after HTTPS slash colon colon, I'll say collab dot research dot google dot com slash github i'll remove the dot com from github and then i do this 
the entire code that we had in GitHub is now shown in Google Colab. Right now, I can um, work on this and say delete, 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 and delete. Okay, this is my code. This does not mean your GitHub code is getting changed. Okay, but you can save this to your drive, copy to drive. Okay, you can say cannot save changes. You do not have permission to save this notebook. Keep your changes, make a copy of the notebook. All right. So you can also copy to drive directly from here, or you can say import. You can basically say save, download, um, right? All these other things can be done. Save a copy in GitHub. Now this is going to try and save in your GitHub repository. So you're going to say GitHub repository access. You'll say, yes, you need to give access to GitHub. Authorize Google Colab, right? Um, and it will ask for your password. I'm going to give me password. Yeah, now you see it is going to store the, the template in GitHub repository. The repository I'm trying to use is this. The file path is this, let's say two. Created using Google Colab. Where do you want to store? That is also given the branches. And then this is important link, link to collaborate. Now, when I do this, it is going to help you to directly open the file in your uh, right Google Colab. Look at this. Open in Collab option is given. This is your new file that I have stored. All right. If I uh, try to open the same page here, if I go to the depository and if I say Python codes, you will see Python template is something that I have imported from my local uh, system. And this is the new template that I have created. And this is created using Google Collaborator. And if you click on this, it will open in Google Colab automatically. Right, so this is uh, some, some shortcut to edit your code in Google Colab directly if your code is there in GitHub repositories. Okay, so these are uh, some of the shortcuts. Um, I'm only talking about GitHub UI kind of an interface, but when we talk about Git, there are a lot of things that you have in your uh, um, backend commands, Git commands are there. Maybe in uh, some other sessions, we will have Git related, specific Git related um, right, commands discussion. All right, so this is, these are all uh, whatever we are talking about things right today are specifically for data ingestion related steps. Different things that we practically do when we are going to run with your uh, 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 applications or machine learning applications. All right. Um, to access GitHub, yeah. Yes, yes. Whatever I have shown, within. Um, what codes? I mean, these are all codes that you already have in LMS. It's just that it is there in IPython notebooks with me. You have in .py, you can just create notebooks and then dump it into your Git, Git repositories. That's something that you should be doing. This recording will be available in your LMS Abhishek in recommended video section. You might want to go through those recommended sessions. Yeah, you'll have masterclass sessions. We will keep conducting these kind of sessions every weekend, friends. The masterclass is something which is um, brought into picture to ensure that these new things are are also explained to you people so that you become more practically uh, right aware of various things that are happening in the industry. Great. Um, hope you have enjoyed everyone. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any any questions, you can keep posting them um, in posting your WhatsApp groups or you can contact me or 
you can contact the mentors team and uh, right if they can answer well and good otherwise they will forward it to me and i'll, I'll get your questions addressed is it okay if we save our assignment data sets in yes but data sets uh, especially if they are public it is fine women but if if anything which is private you should not be doing that you have to put it in a private folder and then give access to those private window, uh, private folders right restrictions will be there you need to be careful with that uh, 2 to uh, 6 generally erosion that's the window from 2 pm the information is always being communicated in the WhatsApp groups that you are part of. I will be surprised that you have not seen the WhatsApp messages. Uh, no, there is no session, masterclass session tomorrow. We'll have masterclass session again in next week. These communications are already there on your WhatsApp groups. Please watch out to the messages. All right. Um, until the next class, friends, keep practicing. Try to use Google Collab. Try to use GitHub repositories so that you, you are aware of more practical uh, right, approaches of dealing things. Always focus on automated libraries that we have discussed, auto EDA, auto hyperparameter tuning, and auto ML libraries. Keep looking into that. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Keep studying, keep preparing, and keep upskilling, guys. Good evening.